I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Hampton Sides. I read Hampton's book, In the Kingdom of Ice, and I was riveted. When I was younger, I participated in several wilderness canoeing expeditions, so I had appreciation of the importance of maps. What I didn't fully appreciate, because all of the maps I used were accurate, was the power of a map, a map maker has to convey accuracy, even when that map maker, map maker is not sure of accuracy. Hampton Sides is a historian and editor-at-large at Outside Magazine and a contributor to newspapers and magazines. He has published a number of books and is now at work on a book about the third and final voyage of Captain James Cook. Hampton. Great to be here with you. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, I'm, a, I'm uh, right now in the boonies of, uh, in the boonies of Alaska uh, and uh, with my family. Um, kind of on a Captain Cook tour, but I've taken, taken a little uh, detour to come up here to Denali to see that uh, this amazing mountain. I have a moose and her calf just right outside my window. Um, so if I feel, if I appear distracted, that's what's going on. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to, to meet with you. I wish I could be there in person to talk about maps. I, I'm a bit of a mapaholic myself and have been for a long time. Uh, they just provide just such a fascinating window on history and uh, both the uh, what was known then and, 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 and tellingly what was not known, uh, the great parts of the world that were still undiscovered, uh, that had never been charted. Uh, and that is certainly um, largely what my story in the Kingdom of Ice was about. Uh, the voyage of the USS Jeanette, which was the first official U.S. Navy-led attempt to reach the North Pole, uh, but based on some pseudoscience, some erroneous ideas, some faulty maps, uh, but intelligence that was at that time very, very much in the you know cutting edge. Um, but unfortunately, as we learned during the great age of exploration, often uh, many people had to suffer, uh, especially in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, and sometimes they had to die to prove or disprove um, some of the ideas that the scientists and pseudoscientists uh, put forward. Um, so before I jump into my, some of my images, uh, can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Is this, is this working out? Can you give me a thumbs up or whatever? We, we're good. In person. Uh, yes. Chad. Sorry. Yes. In person. We can hear you. Okay. Well, I just want to make sure people on, on the zoom can hear you as well. Okay. Yep, great. We're, we're good here on zoom. At least I am. Excellent. Good, good, good. All right. Um, so the um bear with me one second we're going to get this little slide show thing going so the uh, voyage of the uss Jeanette, um this american-led expedition that left san francisco in the summer of 1879 uh, was designed to test some theories about um some of the some some of the warm water currents of the world. There was a theory that essentially um, the Gulf Stream, um, which of course proceeds north through the Atlantic and uh, keeps going, and at that time no one knew where it went. Uh, but there was also another current called the Kurosiwo. There is a current in the Pacific Ocean, which was seemed to be moving up towards the Bering Strait. And um, the theory that was put forward by many different people, but especially um, a guy I'm going to get to in one second, um, was that these two currents moving up towards the North Pole tunnel it, tunneled under the ice, softened up the ice pack, and eventually led to what was thought to be an open polar sea, a warm water basin at the top of the world. Uh, this was a, actually an idea that was <laughs> promulgated by a lot of people. Um, this is an image that sort of shows these two currents as they, as they move towards the North Pole. And um, the, the idea would, would be that if you, could, if you could find the Kurosiwo 
uh, you could sort of smash through that softened ice and get to this uh, warm water basin uh, at the top of the world. There, was, there were all kinds of other bizarre ideas that were out there in the 1860s, 70s, 80s about what was up there. And we have, to, we have to sort of peel back the layers and go back to that time and remember just what, you know, we now know what's up there, uh, but then they didn't. They had no idea whether there was a lost civilization, whether there were holes uh, at the poles like this image shows, um, Stims's hole, which was, this is a guy who went all over the country, all over the world, giving lectures, lectures to sold out crowds. Uh, he argued that there, was a, there were holes at the poles that led down into the earth um, and that there was a lost civilization that was just, you know, they were just dying for us to uh, come, come find them. <laughs> we live inside, drop in and see us. Um, but um, apart from the truly wacky scientists and pseudoscientists, there was this man who I am sure many of you in the map society um, know about. Um, this is one of the greatest cartographers of all time. August Petermann from Gotha, Germany, uh, who put out uh, hundreds of atlases and maps, uh, a guy who was cutting edge, one of the very best, not only cartographers, but he had an entire publishing empire um, that was very influential in the 1860s uh, and 70s, especially. And um, one of the things that August Peterman was interested in, um, aside from excellent facial hair, um, because you see his, he, he, every, almost everyone in this story, Kingdom of Ice, has excellent facial hair. It seems to be a theme of the Gilded Age. But anyway, uh, Peterman was always interested in interviewing explorers who had just come back from far-flung places like the Amazon or the interior of Africa or Australia, but he was especially interested, obsessed really, with the Arctic. What was up there? How do we get there? What does it look like? Are there continents? Are there islands? Um, is it warm? Is it cold? And he was one of the foremost promulgators of this idea that there was an open polar sea. If we could just find it, get through that ice and get to it, you could sail safely to the North Pole. Um, so uh, this guy, uh, James Gordon Bennett, who was a newspaper publisher, uh, then the publisher of the New York Herald, the largest newspaper in the world, um, was himself really interested in expeditions of exploration um, because they sold a lot of newspapers. Um, and this was his newspaper and uh, he's, he was also known for a lot of other things like importing ballooning to the United States, but probably most famous for sending this guy, Stanley, to Africa to find, to find Livingston. Um, didn't really need to be found, but um, be that as it may, this, uh, these series of articles that he published in the New York Herald, uh, Stanley's articles were blockbuster hits and James Gordon Bennett, the publisher of the New York Herald, was looking for um, a new way to, a new expedition that would sell more newspapers. And he decided to bankroll, along with the U.S. Navy, this attempt to reach the North Pole through the Bay Strait. This is the commander of the USS Jeanette and really the protagonist of the book. Um, and the, uh, the, with the in intensely American name of George Washington DeLong, um, a uh, lieutenant in the U.S. Navy who, who leads the voyage. Um, this, is the, this is the ship, the Jeanette, um, which had been a British vessel, but it was rechristened the Jeanette after the, that's the name of the newspaper publisher's uh, sister, Jeanette. Um, they left from San Francisco in, um, in the summer of 17, excuse me, 1879 and uh, headed up to Alaska through the Bering Strait, when they promptly did not find the Kuro Sea, well, they did not find the open polar sea. What they found was ice, lots and lots and lots of ice. And they promptly got stuck in the ice and they drifted in, in the ice for 
two years, drifting meh, more or less in the direction of the North Pole, uh, but uh, feeling enormous pressures from the ice pack. And this ship is constantly uh, being uh, throttled by the ice. And finally, in the summer of 1880, um, it, uh, it is crushed by the ice pack and sinks to the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, leaving these 33 men and their 40 dogs and three open boats um, out, stranded out on the ice, uh, and not too far from the North Pole, really. Uh, but th this story becomes less than a story of science and more a story of s pure survival. How are they going to get home? It's one of the great survival stories, I think, of American history, if not world history. It's like the American Shackleton story. Um, they have to drag these boats over the ice um, as they move towards uh, the middle of Siberia. Um, not knowing even when they reach Siberia, uh, if they will find people, if they'll find someone to rescue them. Um, of course, they have no way to communicate with the world. So it becomes one of those, uh, <laughs> those great survival stories uh, in the Shackleton um, tradition, uh, trying to avoid scurvy, trying, you know, they have to hunt for themselves. They have to keep their morale up. They have to, uh, uh, you know, try to make sure that uh, there's no, um, you know, mutinies, um, that there's an ultimate, you know, no cannibalism, which seems to be another theme in so many of these Arctic tales. But the ship sank, and this is kind of the story for uh, three months. They have the summer um, to get to open water where they can then sail to Siberia. Uh, it's extraordinary how Captain DeLong held these men together during that summer uh, as they as they move these boats over the ice cap, uh, ice pack. Um, the, uh, they finally did, did, did reach open water. And, uh, oh, I forgot to mention one other thing, which is this, this ship was uh, packed with all the latest inventions, American inventions. And one of the inventions was uh, Edison, an early prototype of Edison's light bulb. The idea was that you know, it'd be dark all the time uh, when they were up there during the winter months. And it would be great to have a bunch of Edison's light bulbs lighting up the North Pole. Um, the lights in the end were never used. They didn't quite work. But as an example of, of what this voyage was, which was essentially the Gilded Age, American explorers and the, in the, in the U.S. Navy were interested in sort of flexing their muscles and competing on the world stage in what had largely been up to that point, uh, a European endeavor to solve this great cartographic puzzle of what was up there at the top of the world. Uh, and so the Americans were trying to show that they, that they could do it. Um, let's see, I'm skipping through a little of this here. Um, I'm not gonna tell you uh, precisely what happens. Um, with the with the rest of the voyage because i you know hope some of you will uh, read the book <laughs> buy the book don't google it uh but i will say that there are survivors um yeah there's a copy of the paperback <clears throat> but um there are survivors remarkably uh, really almost miraculously uh and as they finally make landfall they're moving towards um let's see if i have a picture here an, an extraordinary place. Um, oh, and I've, I, another thing that's important to mention is these log books. So, you know, one, one of the many decisions that Captain uh, DeLong had to make was what to bring with him on this great trudge across a thousand miles of the ice. Um, and perhaps the very heaviest thing that he had to contend with was these log books. But he knew that if he didn't bring the log books, uh, this voyage would 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 sort of sink into uh, oblivion. Um, that no one would really know what they did and what they accomplished. And one of the things that they did for the, all those two years while they were stuck in the ice, ice drifting is that they measured everything. They measured the thickness of the ice and the temperature of the water and the temperature of the air, barometric pressure, and so many other things. And uh, these logbooks um, made it across the ice. 
and made it across the open sea to Siberia and made it on uh, reindeer teams and then dog teams. And then finally a train that went all the way to St. Petersburg, finally to London, and then ended up in the National Archives in Washington, where I got to read them and look, study them. And I kind of thought, well, it's sad that these log books didn't really see the light of day. And then I found out about this amazing movement uh, that's spearheaded by Oxford. Uh, it's a citizens, you know, civilian a scientist movement to transcribe and digitize you know, all the log books. And what you ended up with is, is a, an extraordinarily detailed record of the conditions of the ice in 1880s. Uh, so that now climate scientists have, uh, have, have a, base, a baseline to, to compare and contrast um, the thickness of the ice, the qualities of the ice from the 1880s uh, and compare them to today. Um, a lot of characters. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, oh, but I did want to mention this. Um, so I think that every historian has this kind of fantasy that when they're writing their book, um, they're going to, and when they're doing the research, that they will find a descendant of some of the main characters and that this descendant will always just very conveniently have um, a, a trunk up in the attic full of old letters. Uh, of course, it rarely, if ever, happens. But that fantasy actually came true for me on this uh, on this book because um, I had heard there were some distant relatives of the DeLong family living somewhere in New England. I started calling them all of them, uh, and finally found uh, this lady, Catherine DeLong, in Westport, Connecticut, who's you said, it's just so remarkable and coincidental that you called me because I just found this trunk in the attic full of old yellowed letters. And there are the collection, the life collection of Emma DeLong, the wife of the captain, um, who lived to be 90, who saved everything, and who um, wrote these beautiful letters to her husband that she sent to the Arctic by way of Arctic whalers, hoping that they would uh, reach him somehow. They never did reach him, but um, so this, the story becomes also, uh, uh, to my great surprise, also kind of a, a, a love story uh, about their relationship and these beautiful letters that she wrote and letters that he wrote her. Um, and uh, Emma DeLong becomes a major character in the book. This is me with Catherine DeLong at the um, Explorers Club in New York City in front of um, a polar bear that was supposedly shot, I think, by Perry. Um, these letters that were sent um, to the Arctic by Emma DeLong, um, one of them was made it all the way to a hut in Greenland and then was found by Robert Perry. And he stuck it in his fur coat and um, eventually returned Turned, physically returned the letter to Emma DeLong in New York City. And this is one of the letters with this, still with the wax seal on the envelope. So that was kind of a tr treasure trove for me and a rare find to, 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 to uh, have access to letters like this. Um, now, uh, let's see. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, <laughs> this is from a longer, a full hour um, talk that I often give. There's some fascinating characters, you know. When I did this book, I lived with these guys, these these 33 men, you know, for for nearly four years. I got to love them and hate them and uh, admire them. And and one of the towering heroes um, of the story is this man, this guy Melville supposedly a distant cousin of the writer Herman Melville, uh, who uh, ultimately became a rear admiral and the in chief engineer of the entire U.S. Navy. But he is one of the, one of the survivors who wrote a, a, a brilliant book about the Jeanette expedition called In the Lena Delta, uh, because they, um, they finally put, in, put their boats into the water and made it towards this Delta, this Lena Delta. Now, the Lena River is one of the one of the great rivers of of Russia, one of the great rivers in the world. 
uh, but it's particularly remarkable for its delta because uh, it freezes and um, it backs up for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles in all directions, creating this unusually large fantail. Uh, and this is where they made landfall. And so you can't imagine a more complicated terrain uh, for these small boats, which had become separated in a gale. Um, you can't imagine a more, you know, labyrinthine kind of um, environment for them to try to find each other, to try to find civilization, to go against the currents, these thousands and thousands of islands. Uh, but this is a, a NASA photo of uh, the land and Delta during winter time. Um, the Jeanette voyage was extremely well known in its time, uh, considered a very consequential expedition. It was a failure in many, many respects, but um, the uh, journals of the voyage were published and became best-selling books. There were all sorts of other books. Uh, uh, the publisher, James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald, got his blockbuster because they sold tons and tons of newspapers around the world. Um, lots of other books were published, but then it kind of just faded into oblivion and became um, perhaps uh, overtaken by uh, other expeditions um, towards the Arctic or towards uh, uh, the South Pole as well. Um, so that's, that's it in, in a nutshell. But what I didn't really mention about the map maker uh, who is sort of behind this expedition in so many ways, August Peterman, um, although he was one of the world's greatest map makers, uh, he, he had some, just some really, I would say almost criminally wrong ideas about what was up there. And he was, you know, kind of considered your classic armchair explorer where he didn't himself go to any of these places, but he encouraged other expeditions, many expeditions to the North Pole to kind of prove his ideas. And, um, and this was one of them. Uh, James Gordon Bennett, the publisher actually went all the way to Gotha, Germany and met with Bennett, uh, met with um, Peterman and they discussed how to attack the North Pole, how to prove the theory of the of the two currents warming up the the ice, um, where where to prosecute this expedition, um, and but at this by this point in his career, Peterman was suffering from episodes of manic depression, uh, and he shortly before the Jeanette set sail committed suicide. Um, his world there in Gotha was slowly but surely diminishing. There were other uh, better publishers elsewhere. Uh, his map making uh, enterprise was, uh, was slipping a bit. And uh, tragically, he committed suicide right as this voyage was uh, uh, getting started. Uh, we know exactly, by the way, where the Jeanette sank because they took very accurate and very, you know, a, a numerous uh, uh, readings of where, you know, where they were when it sank. They they had only about an hour to get out out of the ship and get out on the ice with their few belongings. But they had rehearsed all this. They knew this the ship was going to probably sink, so they got their stuff out there and they immediately took these readings. And um, there have been some expeditions led by Russian, uh, well, Russian oligarchs <laughs> to. Uh, to try to reach this site of the wreck, um, it's in not it's not in very deep water. Um, it's um, off what are now known as the DeLong Islands, um, in, in, off the central Arctic coast of Siberia. And there's a little there's a little um, pin there that shows uh, where 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 the wreck is. Um, it'd be really interesting and fascinating to to find the wreck. Um, it'd be great to sort of dig into the holes of the ship and find those lights by that made by Thomas Edison and um, a number of other things that have been proposed to, to look for. But given our current relationship with Russia, that's probably not something that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, but that is kind of the speed dating, uh, uh, very quick uh, version of, uh, of the account of the USS Jeanette. 
um, is a story that I'm, I'm sure many of you in the MAP Society know something about, or certainly know something about Thomas Peterman, who is a, you know, who is a um, towering figure in cartography. In talk cartography, um, his maps, as some of you may know, fetch huge sums of money at auction at you know places like Sotheby's. Um, they are incredibly detailed. They're incredibly beautiful, four color maps, uh, and they uh, they are often erroneous because he was so interested in um, what was not known that he sometimes let his imagination run, run ahead of himself. And, and he would get these various um, random reports from explorers and he would incorporate their observations uh, into his maps. And sometimes they were just a kind of a, really a first draft um, of what, 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 what is out there, what is up there. Um, but anyway, so with all of that, um, thank you uh, said, let's get Let's jump into some questions if we can. Great. Thank you, Hampton. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question in the chat, in the Q&A section, excuse me, um, from John Jablonski. Sorry if this seems silly, but if no one made it until 1909 and Perry had Inuit people with him, had no one asked them, what's up there? Did no Inuit say, just more ice, more people on the other side? Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I don't know that much about Perry, but yes, I mean, I think that there was definitely a... Um, skepticism among the Inuit of like, why are you doing this? So uh, we, we kind of know what's up there and it's not, there's not a whole lot to be seen. Uh, it did ultimately seem like a, a rather abstract prize to win. Uh, we know that now, but we didn't then know if there was, maybe you eventually get to a point where there's a warm water basin or, or, or you get to the point where there's a, who knows, an island, a civilization of some sort. Uh, the Inuit perhaps had not gone all the way to the North pole. They, they'd gone far in that direction, but um, yeah, uh, it's really hard for us. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. It's really hard for us. I think to understand how much this nagging question of what was up there, how much it captivated the scientists, how much it captivated politicians, how, how much it tied into kind of the competition among various nations, and, and how much uh, it just drove people crazy. Not, not only that we didn't know what was up there, but that we couldn't figure out just the logistics of how to, how to get up there. Um, and it was one of the great planetary enigmas. And, you know, now we can look back on it and say it's pretty silly. Um, but then it was an all-consuming thing. And, it, and needless to say, it took the lives of many people. Uh, and it, um, of course, it was also tied into this other large quest, which was to find a Northwest Passage or a Northeast Passage over, over Asia or over, over Canada um, for shipping reasons and economic reasons. That was a great quest. But um, at a certain point, just reaching the North Pole became kind of a grail unto itself that um, drove people crazy. Hampton, as a follow-on to that, can you tell the story that you told in the book without giving anything away about how some of the um, uh, uh, some of the 33 men were reacted to by the Inuit when they uh, found them as they were on the Lena River Delta trying to reach safety? That was an yeah. interesting reaction to, that 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 some yeah. of them had had from the locals. Well, well, they were a different tribe, actually, not Inuit. They were the, the Yakuts, uh, which is. Uh, actually speak a language that is related to Turkish. Um, there are people who lived out there and around that Lena Delta um, seasonally. They, they moved back from the ice when it, when, uh, when it got to be um, inhospitable. But yes, they, they didn't, at first they ran away from these explorers, De DeLong and his men. Uh, they were terrified by them. They thought they might be ghosts uh, that they, had come up out of the ice. They just couldn't imagine that they'd come from a ship. Um, and, you know, they looked, of course, by this point, terrible. And, you know, they were dirty and greasy and, and starving. And uh, they looked like ghosts. And so at first they, uh, they ran away from them. But in the end, um, 
accepted them and embraced them and saved their lives. Uh, and really, the survivors owe their lives to these to 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 uh, the, these people didn't have a lot of money and they didn't have a lot of food uh, and they didn't have a lot of shelter, but they provided it and um, saved the lives of of uh, 13 explorers who made it home. Hampton, hi, this is Ron Gibbs. So thanks for a, a fantastic presentation. I am just about finishing your book, Ghost Soldiers. Oh, okay. And, uh, and I wonder, uh, and it's a general question about your writing, how you get turned on to write about these very disparate uh, pieces of fascinating history? Yeah. Um, well, it's only... It's only after I've written uh, four, five, six of these books now I that I begin to see a pattern or a theme. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't necessarily consciously aware of of a theme. I, you know, I just kind of moved from one to another to another. But one one theme that clearly grabs me and 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 runs through all my books is this theme of survival and sort of what combination of traits do people summon um, often unconsciously or, 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 you know, without, without any kind of knowledge of that they had these traits um, during an ordeal of some sort. Often it's some of books like ghost soldiers are set in war. Um, others are set in these sort of exploratory expeditions to the far corners of the world. Um, and I'm fascinated by, by that question of what, what, what got them through this? And what got them to the other side? How did they survive? And what decisions that were made um, led to their survival or or, or their demise? Um, and it, it's some often a question of good leadership or bad leadership. Um, I believe DeLong was a great captain who made a lot of correct decisions. Uh, by the way, Captain DeLong did not believe in this Kuro Siwo open polar sea thing. He he wanted to do this expeditions for his own reason, but he thought the science behind it was, <laughs> was baloney. Um, and uh, so leadership is important, but also what, what happens in these situations so often is that somebody who is not even a person of any great authority uh, or standing or stature emerges as the real hero. It emerges, has these, this set of qualities that in, in an ordeal um, becomes obvious to everyone. And, um, uh, certainly in the kingdom of ice has that. And so did ghost soldiers where these people who were not officers, but they were just grunts, you know, uh, who they didn't even know they had this combination of qualities uh, until, until the chips were down. And um, there's a guy named Nindeman in kingdom of ice who emerges as really just, just a, a superhero almost like uh, his, his ability to withstand the ice and the cold and his, abilities as a hunter uh and on and on it goes but uh so I, that seems to be a theme that grabs me i mean i'm i'm looking also for just great stories um across a spectrum of american history uh i'm, I'm interested in um narrative i you know i i i i'm not an academic historian i don't necessarily have a thesis that i'm trying to prove in my books i'm usually looking for a great tale that has a great story arc to it and, and really strong characters. And, uh, so, um, so that's what I'm usually looking for. And that's usually what grabs me in the end is, is the characters themselves. Hampton, this is, uh, Salim. Uh, Hi. thanks for a great talk. Uh, could you, um, unshare your screen so, so we can see more of you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, stop share. Yep. That should do it but I can't seem to, yeah, maybe this is one way to do it. And uh, stop share. Okay. Better? Yeah. Great. Great. A question in the audience? Oh, great. Hampton, thank you for a fascinating story well told. And I have a map society type question since uh, you described, or the book described, uh, the log described a lot of uh, detail on the ice pack. Is there a before and after map example of the ice pack 
then and now? There have been various uh, projections. Um, there, there's a group out of the uh, University of Washington in Seattle that have, have, have actually done some, some maps like that. Um, I, I could try to find them for you after the talk. Um, what's interesting is that they, they determined that had the USS Jeanette set sail in current times, uh, they probably would never have been stuck in the ice, their whole, their whole trajectory, um, except, you know, near the end. But certainly during summer, they would not have been stuck in the ice. So the ice pack has receded uh, considerably, but it's also changed in quality. It's, uh, it is not ancient ice. It's ice that has thawed and frozen again and thawed and frozen again. It has a different kind of quality. It's, it's, it's not as thick. It's not as it, extent is not as great. And it's, uh, it's a different kind of ice. Um, and much more so than my climate, uh, science specialist even anticipated. Um, and so, you know, it's, it is kind of does provide a very alarming kind of snapshot of what was before and what we have now. Um, and the trends that are in motion. I'm afraid it's not a, a it's not a encouraging it's not an encouraging story at all. But thanks for your question. Are there any in the chat? I thought I saw John say something. Well, I'll ask one. Uh, Hampton. Can you talk about Peterman and the advances in map making that he uh, did, the, 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 the positive advances to cartography that he was responsible for? Absolutely. Well, well you know, I mentioned earlier that he loved to interview explorers and get the, you know, on the ground latest information about various expeditions and incorporate those into his maps immediately. I mean, within... A season he had he had he and his, and I should say, at a certain point he, at a certain point he wasn't doing these maps anymore. He had a whole army of cartographers working under him, so they could move fast and publish very quickly. Um, so you have a lot of information about um, you know depth of the water or um, isotherms uh, showing um, different climates or, or and some of these ideas came from his the great uh, the other great german cartographer and scientist and all-around genius uh alexander von humboldt uh, but uh you know realizing that a map isn't just um showing landforms it, it should show give you some sense of the flora and fauna and it should give you some sense of you know the, cl the climate and al obviously altitude um and um uh prevailing wind patterns uh or uh, the presence of sandstorms, or uh, uh, he had, for example, in, in his maps of the Sahara, you know, he showed Bedouin, you know, um, uh, migratory patterns <laughs> and uh, perhaps uh, migratory patterns of, of animals. Um, so his maps are insanely detailed and, and but also beautifully rendered. Uh, and he was, he and his operation there in Gotha, Germany were, they were on the cutting edge of printing as well. So these are beautiful maps printed on thick stock, beautiful paper, uh, beautiful atlases. Um, and uh, so there was a kind of a, an art to these maps that I think in some ways is lost. You know, they're just beautiful to look at and to, and, and to, to study. Um, those are some of his advances. Uh, he also wrote a lot of articles that accompanied his maps so in some sense, it was almost like a precursor to National Geographic or something. You have a, you have a map, but then you have print, you know, that a, an essay that would be written about some, some quality from the map. Um, but then there were these great unknown parts of the world, Terra Incognita, North Pole, South Pole being the, maybe the two greatest ones. Um, and that's kind of where he... <laughs> got ahead of him. He got a little over his skis. You know, he, he, uh, he had these ideas. He was very passionate about them. And he decided that um, it just had to be this way. Um, 
one of the one of the fan, most fanciful ones is um, there's a map that shows um, Peterman's idea that Greenland continues on up and over the North Pole with this long, narrow trunk-like thing that looks almost like an elephant's trunk. It goes all the way to what we now know as Rang Wrangel Island, um, which is just off of the Siberian coast of Russia. And um, I mean, it's just completely hopelessly wrong. And where he got this idea is, 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 is just not known. Sometimes he, he listened to whaling tales that were kind of tall tales. Uh, and he was a little susceptible uh, to um, disinformation, misinformation, and he plugged some of that information into his maps. Uh, and, and they were they're, they're rather comical, some of them. Thank you very much. Let's check one more time. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, we got one back here from Chris. Jake. Hampton, I understand you're at Denali right now. Yes. And I, I have some uh, knowledge of Denali and was on the website a couple weeks ago and saw there was a big landslide on the street, on the road into the park. But it was, if, if you have the time, I suggest that you take the road as far as you can by bus, and you're a little bit of an explorer, I sense, and hop off the bus and go a quarter or half mile off the road, just a little day hike, so that you'll get the feeling of the park and, and uh, the size of the human being in comparison to the, to the landscape up there. Just an idea for you. I, I, will, I will definitely do that. And uh, yes, that landslide was very serious. It was, uh, thank God it happened at night and it was on the, the main road. Uh, and, uh, it just completely collapsed. And, um, if any, if, if anyone had been on the road, they would have obviously died immediately. It's, 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 uh, it was a catastrophic thing and it'll take, I don't know how many years to, uh, to fix that. But, um, yeah, I've been exploring in various ways. I was on bikes yesterday. Today, we're going to take a bus deep into, uh, into Denali. Um, and, uh, it's just, it, the size, the scale of it is extraordinary. And, um, uh, and we're not even, it, most of the park is completely off limits. Uh, there, there are no roads, uh, there are no ways to get to so much of it. So, but, a uh, beautiful place and, uh, a great place to be talking to a group of, uh, map hounds from, um, it's just an extraordinary part of the world. I, 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 I don't know if we're, about out of time, but I, I really enjoyed uh, meeting with you and uh, I hope you have a great conference. I wish it could have been there in person. Hampton, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.